This is the Maple 17 training for industrial applications webinar. In, in this webinar, we are going to be taking a tour of some of the fundamental concepts of working with Maple. And uh, this is going to include using Maple's clickable math interface to visualize and solve some mathematical problems. And uh, we're also going to build up to the idea of creating your own custom solutions uh, inside of Maple. And we'll be closing by talking about a couple of applied examples from various fields uh, such as statistics, signal generation, uh, and dynamic systems. So to begin, I wanted to just quickly show you uh, how to find help inside of Maple. So the easiest way to find help in Maple is directly through our help menu. So you go up to the top here, you go help and Maple help. And this brings in up the Maple Help browser. So within the Maple Help browser, you can do a search for various terms. So say for instance, we want to look up differentiate. We would look up the diff command. And this will bring up the diff help page inside of Maple. A shortcut if you're working inside Maple in, a, in an active session is you can just type in question mark and the term or the keyword that you're searching for. So if you type in question mark plot, this will bring up the plot help page. A couple of other really good resources that are readily that are available in our help system uh, include our user manual and programming guide. The the user manual is usually a first good a uh, good for first resource for you when you're starting off with Maple. Uh, and the advanced programming guide is, is kind of when you've been working with Maple for a while, uh, it'll help you to, to build really interesting dynamic examples and to further your programming knowledge. Those, again, are found under the, the Maple Help menu. So now let's move on and actually start entering math and talking to Maple a little bit. So to begin with, I'm going to start very simple. So if we type in 1 plus 1 into Maple, press enter, it'll return a response to us. Now this works for numbers, it also works if we enter in uh, other values such as pi, you'll see here that it'll, in the output line following where I've entered my input, it'll give us the, the value pi. We can then right click on any type of input or output inside of Maple in order to get up our context sensitive menu. And here we can approximate pi to, for instance, 100 digits and it'll return the result to us. We can also enter in math directly into our interface. So here is x squared plus 7x plus 10. Press enter. In the same way that we right clicked on pi, we can also right click on this output. Right click. And for instance, let's integrate this with respect to x. If we want to go the other way, we can also right click on that input or that output and differentiate with respect to x. Now as you've seen, you've, the, the output has been following the input on the next consecutive line. But if we'd like, we can also have the output returned to us on the same line. And we do this by pressing control equals instead of the enter key. So here are a couple of examples. I'm pressing control equals. And one reason why this is really handy is now that I've got my math and my answer on the one line, I can now use Maple's document mode in order to mix in text and math on one line. So you'll notice here that right around this math entry is a little gray box. If I press F5, that box goes away, and I'm actually now in what they call text mode. And that's evidenced up here on our context toolbar. So now I can just type in text the way I normally would say in another word processing program and mix in text alongside, alongside active math and form a full sentence that mixes both text and math in one place. We can now interact with both the text and math in, in the same way that we would in a word processor, changing the attributes up here on our text toolbar and so on.
Another quick and easy way for you to enter in math into Maple is by using Maple's palettes. So over here on the left hand side, I'm going to expand our expression palette. So with the expression palette, we can enter in a number of uh, terms such as in integrate or sum or a, a product or a partial derivative or so on. And we can do all this with just one click. So here I'm just going to build a quick, a, a quick example. If I click on the summation palette item, that'll insert the sum and I can now just start typing wherever you see the blue. And I'm just going to press tab in my, on my keyboard in order to move through this sum notation. And we will do this to n minus 1. And again, to get the e to the k, I'll, I can type this in with my keyboard, but in this case I'm just going to show you this by inserting the expression palette item of e to the k. Press enter, and our result is returned to us on the next line. So let's do another quick example. This time we'll do the partial derivative with respect to x of the square root of x squared minus y squared. And as we saw before, I'll press control equals in order to have the result returned on the same line. Now one of the keys of working inside the Maple environment is that you can easily assign values to variable names. So in Maple, if you type in x colon equals a value, what this does is it assigns that value to the variable name x. So if later on in our session we want to reuse x, x now has that assigned value. So this is, you can see here, it's very easy to increment this value. So if I type in something like x colon equals x plus 5, the value of x is now incremented by 5. I'm going to go back over here to our palettes again. I'm going to open up this time our variables palette. And here you can actually see any active variables that are open in your current session as well as their value. So again, if we go back over here and I'm just going to increment x by 5 again, the value is reflected both here and in our variables palette. One other way to assign uh, variable names to input in Maple is by using the context menu. So here we have y squared plus 2y minus 7. I'm going to right click on this, go to assign to a name, and let's just assign that to the name M. We'll press OK. And now later on in our session if we use M, Maple will return y squared plus 2y minus 7. Now if we'd like to reclaim m or x so we can use it again in a, in a further computation, we can do this by unassigning the value for x or m, respectively. There are a couple different ways to do this. We can either go up to our variables palette, choose m, right click, unassign, and that means we can now use m again. Or we can use the unassign command in Maple. So that's just unassign x comma m, this, this will unassign two, vari two variables at a time, but otherwise you could use it to just assign one as well. Now you may have noticed as we've been walking through these first few examples, there's been a steadily increasing number on the right side. These are what we call equation labels. So you'll notice now when I just entered in these two expressions, we now have equation labels 13 and 14 active in our session. If we want to refer to these, we'll press Control L on our keyboard, and now we can, for instance, enter in equation label 13 plus equa equation label 14, press OK, and have that return a result to us. So now that I've shown you a couple of examples of entering math into Maple, Let's move on and talk a bit about entering matrices. So I'm just going to run through a couple of very quick examples here using our matrix palette. Again, the matrix palette is found over here on the left side. So the first example, I'm just going to construct a 4x4 four four identity matrix. And in this case, I'm going to click on the Choose button in order to drag out the size of the matrix I want. So let's make this 4x4, four four, Identity, and we'll click Insert. Let's try that again, and we'll make another one. We'll make this one 5 by 
5 and in this case I'm actually typing in and uh, in this example let's build one that has ones on and above the main diagonal so we'll make this a one filled matrix that's upper diagonal we'll then insert our matrix and there we go let's try this again by making a three element column vector and for fun let's fill this with random entries and insert the matrix now I'm going to expand on this example a little bit let's actually insert another matrix right in front of this three element column vector so we'll make this one three by three and we'll leave this one as random uh, and so on so now you can see I've ins actually inserted a matrix right in front of our column vector what I can now do is just leave a space between these two. And if you leave a space between uh, two numbers or two matrices in Maple, Maple will treat this as an implied multiplication. So what that means is it'll actually multiply these two together the same way that it would if you used uh, a star symbol or a dot symbol. So the matrix browser is handy if you're entering in smaller matrices. But once you start doing any work that requires you to have really large matrix data sets, uh, you're probably going to want to know the, the matrix command itself. And the matrix command itself is what lies behind any one of these matrices that I just entered here. So the matrix command is capital M matrix, followed thereafter by the dimensions of the matrix. So very quickly, if we wanted to create a 2500 by 200 matrix, I just type in matrix 2500 comma 200. This is returned to us then in a matrix summary form, rather than being displayed in line on the, on the worksheet. Because if it was going to basically be displayed in line on the worksheet, you'd get over 2,500 lines uh, put directly to your display. And this, and this would take up a lot of screen real estate, as you could imagine. So instead, we get it in the summary form. And what you can do with the summary form is you can double click it in order to bring up a matrix browser in order to browse through the entries. Now I'm going to go back here and just modify our matrix command a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to add in a generator. So the third optional entry for the matrix command is to give it a generator. If we put zero, this will fill the whole matrix with zeros. If we fill it with one, if we put one, it'll fill it with ones. More interestingly, if we fill it with, if we put the generator as rand one to 10, what this is going to do is it's going to fill it with random numbers taken from the values 1 through 10. So again, we'll generate the matrix, click on the summary form, and here is our large matrix. As you can see, it's now been filled with random entries between 1 and 10. Now, if you'd like, you can click on export at the bottom in order to export this matrix directly to an Excel XLS file. Uh, you can specify the street name and cell range uh, as, as you see fit. I'll just click cancel for now and we'll click done in order to close this. Now I wanted to make one mention really quickly of the fifth tutorial inside of our Maple Portal. And I haven't mentioned the Maple Portal, but the Maple Portal is a it's a resource that's available through our help menu. Again, it's help, manuals, resources, or more, and Maple Portal. And the fifth tutorial inside of the Maple Portal is geared toward working directly with matrices and vectors. So again, this, this is an excellent resource if you're starting off, if you want to learn a, bit, a little bit more about how to work with vectors and matrices or create lists and so on in Maple. Uh, this is the fifth tutorial inside of the Maple portal, and it's a great read. But now let's move on and talk a little bit about visualization in Maple. And to begin, I want to show a couple of examples of plotting in two dimensions. So for, for my first example, I'll do 6x, keeping in mind that if I have, leave a space between the 6 and the x, this is treated as an implied multiplication in Maple. So here I've entered in 6x minus x squared. And now what I want to do is I want to plot this. So to do that, we can just right click on this input and go to Plots, 2D Plot. And this quickly and easily generates a 2D plot for us. I'm just going to grab this and drag this out a little bit bigger. Same way that we can click on math or matrices, uh, we can also right click on plots. When we right click on the plot, we're presented with a totally different uh, context menu that you've seen before. So in this case, I'm going to turn on the 
point probe in order to examine the data a little bit closer. So for interest sake, let's turn on the nearest datum. And what this does, it gives us the nearest points on this curve. So moving on, let's plot two plots. So in this case, I'm going to enter in sine squared of x as well uh, as sine of x over 2. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on my second input and go with plots, 2D plot to generate a plot. Make this a little bit bigger. So the same way we saw before, I can right click on this. And in this case, I'm just going to change a little bit, uh, or I'm going to change a few of the attributes of the, the line. So I'm going to make the line a little bit thicker. And again, I'll right click, uh, and we'll make this dashed line. Now what we can do inside of Maple is we can easily just grab some math expressions and drag them to an active plot in order to plot that on top of another existing plot. So here I'll just go up, grab sine x squared, drag that down, and place it right on top of the plot. So now you can see this superimposes one plot on top of another. We can still interact with both plots as though they were individual plots, but now we have them on one plotting surface. So I'll just do that one more time. So I go up, I grab a, an expression, I drag that to an active plot, and it superimposes that mathematical expression on top of an existing plot. We can now right click on the other plot line in order to perform operations to it. So I'm going to make this line wider again and let's change the, this to a, a dash dot line. So now that we've got a plot that we're reasonably happy with, we can of course also right click on that plot and export that plot. So here I've right clicked on it, I go export and let's choose to export this to a PNG file. Let's export this to the desktop as my plot, click save, and we now have managed to export a plot to a PNG file that you can then use in any one of your documents or presentations. Now as we saw with the matrix command before, um, you can certainly generate a lot of really excellent plots really quickly and easily using our clickable math techniques. But under, underneath all the clickable math, there is a, a command. And this, in this case for plots, it is our plot command. And the way the plot works is that you type in plot followed by what you want to plot on your interface. So in this case, you can see I've actually entered in a sequence of plots. And you can tell it's a sequence in Maple by this square bracket notation. You can see highlighted now. The square bracket notation tells Maple that we want, or we're, that we're giving it a list. So we're actually going to give this a list filled with this sequence of Bissell J curves. The next option I'm using here is x is equal to 0 to 10. And this tells it that we want to plot values on the x-axis from 0 to 10. And the last option is filled. And what filled does is it fills the area between the curve and the x-axis. So here you can see our sequence of four Bissell J curves, all plotted on the same plot using this one simple plot command. So next, let's talk a little bit about showcasing this in three dimensions. So I'll do this first the clickable way. So we'll type in sine x times y. We'll right click on our input, go to plots, 3D plot, with respect to x and y. And there is our 3D surface. By default, we can rotate this. We can also choose to zoom in, zoom out, and pan this using features on our plot toolbar. Same as we saw with 2D plots, we can also right click on a 3D plot, choose to export. And now you'll notice that the export options, options have actually changed a little bit. We now have a number of different 3D file formats directly available through our export context menu item. So same as with the plot command, plot3d is the equivalent command that lies behind this context menu option that you saw up here. 
So in this case, I've just constructed another simple example for you. In this case, I'm using plot 3D, and I'm going to do a plot of a cylindrical coordinate system. So there's our plot here. We can rotate this around. And let's move on down here and just do another plot in a different coordinate system. And there you are. Now you may be wondering how I generated some of these, uh, some of the code for these plot 3D commands. And one way that we can do this very easily is by using our plot builder assistant. So say if we have some math entered, like x squared plus y squared, we can right click, go to plots, and as we saw before, we can quickly and easily just generate a plot by using 3D plot x and y. But what's more powerful is if we go down to plots, plot builder, and then bring up the plot builder assistant. So here we can change some values. So let's change x-axis from 10 to 10, and we'll do the same thing for the y. And we can preview this now if we'd like to, or we can plot it. But let's go in and actually change some of the options. So now we can customize our plot a little bit further. We'll add in a title and a caption. And we can also change the coloring scheme. We can change the coordinate system, turn off axis, and so on. Uh, here, I usually recommend going in, and we can preview this just to make sure we're happy with how the plot is. And if you were happy, you just wanted to return the plot, you could press plot here, plot here, or so on. But here's the trick with the plot builder. You can also use the plot builder to generate code. So if I press command at the bottom of our options menu, this will return the maple command for generating the plot that we just put together. So now, if I want to, I can just run that code in order to generate that, pl that exact plot. And the reason why this is really handy is if you say you want to go back and change your plot, you want to remove a caption, you want to change the y-axis values, you can do this now just by tweaking this command ever so slightly. And this is going to save you a lot of time because really all you have to do is build this plot command once and once you've built it you can then just tweak little elements of it. Now the plot builder can also be used to generate animations. So here I'm going to use the same expression as before, so y squared plus x squared, but I'm going to multiply it by a parameterized term, sine of a. So let's right click on this expression and go to plots, plot builder, and now we're going to go up to the top here, we're going to select the plot type and choose animation. So now that we've got an animation, we can, of course, preview this using our options. We can change you change any of the, uh, the style sets, the titles, and so on. Uh, but we can also, as we saw before, just choose to return the command. So I'll press command in order to return a standard animation for this surface. So again, I'll grab my command here, and we'll just see what this looks like. So I'll go up now and just, I'm just going to turn down the frames per second here a little bit, just so we get a little bit of a slower animation. And we'll play back how this surface, how this surface varies as we change the value of a in sine of a times x squared plus y squared. So again, to generate that, all I did was right-clicked on the input expression, plots, plot builder, and just fiddled with the commands as I liked and plotted it, or you could preview it directly from here as well. Now, I mentioned before that we can create some pretty uh, neat examples using uh, our commands instead of maple, and I've gone ahead and I've, I've created a, a couple of lines of code here, and what these lines of code do is they create an example that has a 3D sphere surface. I'm just going to turn off the axis here using our right-click menu. And I've also given a matrix. So here in this matrix, I've actually defined a matrix of coordinate points. So here you'll see 600, 600, 600, 400, 400, 200, and so on. And, and this defines a, a system of coordinates that I want our, uh, 
our animation or our fly through of this video to follow. Now when I'm generating a plot, uh, especially with a 3D plot, I can specify a viewpoint or a view path essentially. Now when I give it viewpoint is equal to this path equals m, where it's filled with a matrix of coordinates, this will actually generate an animation that follows a certain path as it's animating it. So here you can see if I play back this animation, this is going to zoom in on the animation all the while rotating through this path. So I'll play that back one more time. So again, we're essentially zooming in and rotating, but all, all that we're really doing is following a defined path. So that's one fun example. That's using the viewpoint option inside of Plot 3D combined with a matrix of coordinate points. Now, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about what plots are available in Maple, I recommend going into our plotting guide. So if you type in question mark plotting guide, or just do a search directly for plotting guide in Maple, this will bring up our Maple plotting guide. And this features uh, all the different plots that are available uh, that can be easily used directly within Maple, as well as that can be kind of used and built upon in order to create your own dynamic examples. So, so this is a really good spot if, if you're interested, if you've got some data and you're not quite sure what plot to apply, you can come into the plotting guide and, for instance, go down and look up statistical plots and, and then view the, all the different plots we have available for statistics uh, and, and then choose a plot based on what the desired effect of the, the, the data, how you want the data to look eventually. So now that I've shown you a, a number of different ways of working inside of Maple, I want to move on and talk a little bit about actually creating your own solutions. And the idea of creating your own solution in Maple is actually going to take some of this basic knowledge I've given you today, uh, as well as a, kind of a greater knowledge of programming inside of Maple. And once you have this, you can really put all this together in order to create your own dynamic applications. And with these dynamic applications, there, there's really no limit to what you can do and what you can create. So I've put together a very quick and crude example here. Like this is this is very very simple, uh, but what we do here is we use three embedded components. One is a dial, taken from our components palette down here, uh, as well as a plot and a math container or text area component. And what these three components do is they can interact with one another. I can have this dial here run some code that affects the plot in the plot window here as well as the text area right next to it. So here's, here you can see as I'm dragging out this dial, I'm getting an effect over here in the plot component as well as the math container here. And, and this is a very, very simple example, but the idea behind it is uh, it's a little bit more profound. With these examples, you can create demonstrations that you can show to a customer or a peer that they don't have to know any knowledge of Maple whatsoever. They can just come in and literally just turn a dial in order to get some type of visual feedback or gain some type of insight directly from Maple. And just to give you an idea of how easy it is to build some of these examples, I'm just going to create one right now. So here I'm going to insert a, a dial as well as a plot component. So first let's just check the component properties here in order to get the plot component name. It's plot1 just so I know where to send the data from our dial. Next, we'll find out what the dial's name is. This is dial1. And I'm just going to change this, these values a little bit. We're just going to set lowest position to be 0, highest position to be 5, and then have the spacing of the minor and major tick marks to be 1. Now let's go in and edit the value changed action. Once we do this, we can go in through our code editor area and we're just going to put in a little bit of code. Now what we need to do in order to send some information to our, our plot component is we need to use the do command. So here we do do plot1 and this is where we want to send some information is equal to plot. Since it's a plot component we obviously have to send it a type of plot so I'm going to use the plot command as we saw before of x to the power of and now I'm going to grab the information from percent sign dial 1. And this then tells Maple that we want to use the information from the, that dial. 
I save this, close the code edit region, and now I can just simply turn this dial and have the plot showcase the values of this of uh, x to the power of the dial, essentially. So x to the power of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So one other way to create examples is by using our exploration assistant. So here I've entered in some math again. I can right click on this math and choose explore. And what I want to do is I want to explore this expression. I want to explore it over the parameters a and b. Uh, x is the variable in this case, so I don't want to explore over that, so I choose to skip that. And then we click explore. We can now insert those rows, those rows, pardon me, directly into the Maple interface. And we're now given two interactive sliders as well as a math interface. So these are the sliders that you'd see just down here in our components palette. So now we can slide out these values and this changes the values of those two parameters, a and b. So we can quickly and interactively see how this entered expression changes for these two parameterized values. So we can also do this using the using plots. So not only just we can use it with not only can we use it for expressions, but we can also use it for plots. So if we enter in a plot, so I've got, in this case I've got plot of cos a times x times sine b of x over a certain range, x is equal to minus 2 to 2, or minus 2 pi to 2 pi. We could right-click on this plot, choose Explore, and since I gave it a range for x here, we'll, you'll notice now that x is not a, a variable listed on the Explore uh, interface here. We can now click Explore, insert the rows, and then drag out the sliders in order to interact with this, uh, this plot interface here. So the explore command can also be used in one contained way. So if we actually go in, and I'm going to show some examples from our explore updated pages. So if I do, a, again, a help search for explore, I'm going to go in, I'm going to show you an example from our, uh, our more pages from April 17. So here you can see this is, if you use explore as the command call, rather than right clicking, explore of a plot, this will then generate a uh, the collection of embedded components that you can then interact with. But if you prefer to bypass the pop-up altogether for Explore, you can also use the Explore command with two options. Here I can specify the parameters A and B, certain value sets I want them to have, as well as initial values for this. So with these options, I can now set the initial value for B and for A, as well as the range for each one of these two parameters. And this is really an excellent way if, if you're looking to control the flow or control the, uh, the, the first example for your users. Uh, you can go in and you can create it, all this using the one command call for Explore. I recommend having a, a, a full read through this Explore help page because uh, this also gives you an idea of how you can use some pre-assigned code and in order to, for instance, generate examples. and, and if you go into our, say, our Ma Maple Math apps, which are readily available through our Tools menu, you'll actually notice that a few of our tool or our Math apps have actually been built using this one uh, command call explore command. And to go back and talk a little bit more about the Maple Portal, there's also the, a, a dynamic applications tutorial. It's the ninth tutorial inside of our Maple portal. And again, I would highly recommend going back and, and viewing that if you're interested in learning more about working with uh, embedded components and creating your own dynamic interactive examples. So let's move on now and talk a little bit about some applied areas of using Maple. And in these examples, I'm going to go a little bit, I'm going to be using a little bit more programmatic terms. So I'm going to be using a lot of Maple syntax for these ones. So let's first press restart. And what this does is it cleans up our Maple environment for us. You'll notice that any variables that were declared previously have all now been unassigned. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Excel tools package. And I'm going to use this to import a data set directly from an Excel XLS file. 
I'm also using this in conjunction with a data table. And this is, again is one of our interactive components found down here in our component palette. And I'm using this to showcase this data set here. So this is it's kind of a consolidated ver version of our matrix browser that we saw before. So here we can go and we can showcase our entire data set as we've got it entered. And now for interest sake, I'm going to also go through and apply a function to the second column. And I do this by first defining a few parameters as well as a parameter or a smoothing function. So let's now make a copy of our data. And now that I've made a copy of it, you'll notice that now it has been pre-populated up here in our other data table. And what I want to do now is I want to apply this function just to the second column of this table. So to do so, I'm going to enter a new data and just specify the second column. This dot dot here tells me that I want to have all the entries for all the rows, but just dealing with the second column. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the second column of the original data. We're going to divide that by the function applied to the first column of that new data. So here I press enter. And now you can see that our values for the second column have changed somewhat using this new function. And if we want to, we can now generate a plot or a point plot of this new data set using the plots point plot command. So there's a point plot of this data set. We can go on and if we wanted to, we can change the symbol of this to be solid circle, change the color to be, uh, let's go with the bluish color, and so on. So moving on, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to fit an interpolating function directly to our, our data set. So what we can do is say choose the first 800 or so of these values, and then we can run some routines uh, from, say, our statistics package or curve fitting package in order to interpolate a function for uh, fitting these points. So the first thing I do here is I, I load the statistics package directly into Maple's memory. So what this does is it basically gives us all the routines, all the procedures that are available inside of the statistics, statistics package. They are now readily accessible within our Maple environment. We, have, we can now run these directly without having to run statistics with the package name. So now I'm just going to go through and I'm going to apply some operations to this data. And now we can plot the result of our interpolating function. So here's our interpolating function. Now to see how well this fits our data, what we can do before is this is the trick that we learned with uh, using two, two plots one on top of the other. We can just grab a plot data structure as well and we can drag that to another plot. So I'm going to press and hold control on the keyboard and just drag that up to our existing plot. And now you can see our plot data structure as well as the interpolating function for the first 800 or so points. So let's now do an example with a three-dimensional data set. So again, I press restart here to clear our session and let's read in our data. In this case, I'm going to use the import matrix command to read in data from a CSV file. So here you can see import matrix from our new data.csv file. And this returns our data to us in this summary format. You can double click there to browse it with our matrix browser. And in this example, what we're going to try to do is we're going to take our three-dimensional data set and we're going to try to fit a surface to it. So to do so, I want to first generate a general form of a bivariate polynomial. And just, just to get a, a, a smooth fit, but not go kind of over the top with, uh, with a fit, we're just going to use a third order bivariate polynomial. So here's, here's an example of this polynomial here. And in the next step, what we're going to try to seek to do is to find the optimal values for all of these parameters here, such that this surface best fits our data. So to do so, we're going to use routines first to normalize our data set from linear algebra, as well as the optimize, uh, optimization minimize command. And what this will do is it will return these parameter values. So here you can see these are the, all the values for this bivariate polynomial up here. 
And now let's go through and generate a couple of three-dimensional plots that showcase both our surface as well as all of our points. So here you can see the surface and all the points. It looks like it fits fairly well. But if, if you'd like kind of a baseline way of, of measuring uh, if, if your fit is actually fairly successful, uh, I always recommend going in and having a look at the statistics scatterplot 3D with the low S fitting command uh, set it to true. And what this will do is it'll generate uh, Maple's version of its most optimized surface for a data, data set. So here you can see, here's our plot. And you'll notice that the characteristics of this plot are very similar. It kind of has the same shape. It's certainly a little bit more refined around the corners when we use this option. Um, but I think, I think with our bivariate polynomial that we generated before, if we had, say, turned it up to a fourth or fifth order polynomial, uh, we would certainly have had a, a slightly closer fit around these edges. But in any case, we kind of can see now from above that we're at least on the, on the right track with what we were doing before. And this was certainly the right approach to fitting the, the data set. So let's talk now about differential equations. And I've got here a couple of examples on how to solve differential equations using our dsolve command. So with the dsolve command, what you usually do is you declare a system of differential equations. And then you can just use dsolve with that system of, equ of equations. What this will do is it'll return a general solution to you. So here we just see there's the underscore C term in front of each one of these. And this just denotes that we're using a general solution. If we have any initial conditions that are known, we can enter these initial conditions into our dsolve command. So here we've got the, the, the original system of ODEs that we declared, as well as the initial conditions. And we can solve this in order to get a specific solution. So let's do this again with a second order initial value problem. So here's our system of differential equation. And we have two initial conditions. And then we can use the dsolve command to find a numeric solution. Now what we also want to do is we want to do this over a certain range. So let's just return the values between 0 and 1. And you'll notice this is actually returned as a procedure rather than being returned as a value or a set of, a set of values. And this actually makes it much easier for us to now query it in order to generate a plot of the solution space for this differential equation. In our third example here, we can do a nonlinear boundary value problem. And in this case, I've actually taken the liberty of putting together our differential equation, as well as our initial conditions into one set. And you'll see now with the curly braces here, this denotes a set inside of Maple. So let's enter this set of values into Maple. And then we'll just solve, desolve, numeric. Uh, but in this case, let's output this to an array. And with the output array option, we'll actually get values returned to us for a certain uh, interval of, of values. And this, again, if we use plots, ODE plot, we can visually see this uh, from the ODE plot directly. So now let's move on and do a couple of examples from dynamic systems. So to start, we're just going to restart our Maple interface. Now let's load the dynamic systems package. So what we can do now is we can generate four state matrices. So we'll type in our first A matrix, our B matrix, C matrix, and our D matrix. Now a special consideration for Maple 17 is that we can now actually use D as a variable name or a matrix name. Uh, previously this was not possible in Maple because the D uh, command, it was actually D was a command uh, that was a shortcut for using the differentiate command. So you could use D of a function with respect to X, we'll say, and have that return the derivative. So now if we, if we actually declare a local D, we can now use D as a variable name. So now moving forward, if we want to now create a state space matrix or a state space representation, pardon me, of the model, we can use SS is equal to state space of ABCD. And then we can print the system back. 
We can also generate a transfer function for this for the state space representation. We can print this system as well as querying it for the latter part here. So now let's move on and actually do a couple of response plots and get some more information about this system. So here's our response plot of our state space representation. And we can also, from, this, this, from these values, we can generate some of our step properties. I'm just going to open this up to give you an idea of where these values are coming from. We can quickly and easily just generate the rise time, the peak time, the overshoot time, and the setting time. So now let's talk about signal processing. So new in 17 is our signal processing package. So here I'm going to load signal processing engine as well as loading our plots package. So now let's populate our signal data. And again, I'm reading in a file, so I'm going to use Excel tools import of a XLS file, so a data.xls. And now we can again see the data table below. This is using our component palette over here. And this contains all the 1,024 experimental data points. And we've assigned this to the variable name data, or signal data, actually. So now let's go on and generate a plot of our original data. Now you can see with this plot, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, um, th there seems to be some underlying trend here, but it's, it's a little bit obscured by noise. You can see that there's, there's something that seems to be going on here, but th there's also a lot of noise happening in between. So what we want to do using signal generation or signal processing is we actually want to filter this. So first, let's examine this data in the frequency domain and view the power spectrum. So here's our power spectrum plot. And here, from this plot, you can actually notice that there's two dominant frequencies. And these are polluted a little bit by this lower power noise. So if we remove the noise below a certain threshold, here we're going to set the threshold at 8, we can now pull out just the power, or the filtered power spectrum. So now if we apply an inverse FFT, we can filter this and generate the filtered data plot alongside of our original data plot. And here I'm using the plots display command in order to generate uh, a, a plot using two different plots. So now you can see that there's our filtered signal on top of the noisier original signal. So what we've, what we've done here is we've, we've eliminated a lot of the noise and we've really made the underlying trend that much clearer. So that closes out our examples or our application section. So uh, to close this webinar, what I wanted to quickly leave you with was a couple of more excellent resources that we have available for you uh, on our online website. So first is our application center. And our application center is found under www.maplesoft.com. And then you can browse to uh, the application center. So that's, again, our website under resources and then application center. And the application center actually features over 2,200 applications. And a lot of these have been contributed and created by MapleSoft ourselves, as well as directly by our user community. So here, if you're interested for, say, signal processing, you can go under engineering, signal processing, and view a number of different applications that have been created to solve specific examples or um, often are white paper demonstrations of what you can do with Maple or what has been done with Maple in the past. So there's a lot of really, really excellent work that's gone into the Application Center. And uh, if you're kind of looking for a starting point, if you're looking, if you're interested in, say, signal processing, if you're looking for a starting point to generate a spectrogram, you can go, do you can go to our Application Center and you can download a spectrogram generator and you can use that code in your own Maple application. And uh, you can use it also to learn and to really build some dynamic and interesting stuff. 
Also on the web is our application briefs. So this is under resources, application briefs. And this is kind of a collection of, of more general use case scenarios for how Maple has been used in various industrial sectors such as, uh, such as in financial engineering, uh, operations research, and there's certainly many articles here uh, from the automotive, aerospace, and power industries. So here you can go in and you can research different ways in which our users are utilizing Maple for all these different purposes. So that closes off our webinar for today. Thank you very much for joining us.